Listen, I'm a crier. Y'all got to stop that. I will cry. Don't make me cry, please. At, uh, well done. Well done, 1122. Well done. Uh, I am here for your tacos. Uh, and your sushi. And whatever else uh, might feed these guns. So please, uh, feed me. And, uh, and I will not go T-Rex on anybody tonight. Uh, my wife sends her greetings. Uh, uh, Pastor Joby was absolutely correct. Uh, she is growing my giant child uh, inside of her. We have, uh, we have a seven-year-old uh, daughter and a five-year-old daughter. And, uh, and when we found out we were pregnant, I began to pray and, uh, and ask the Lord if he would allow me to beat the odds and have a boy. And on that day in the sonogram room when the woman said, Y'all better help me preach now. I know he trained you. <laughs> Mr. Crump, it's a boy. I said, bless him. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> so we are very excited, and, uh, and she wishes she could be here. Uh, but I'm glad that she has allowed me to drift uh, for a couple days to be with you. Uh, um, all jokes aside, Pastor Joby, thank you for your love, for your honor. Um, he has become one of my dear friends, and, uh, and I, I could not be more pleased uh, that he would trust me with all of my insanity uh, and my crisscross part to preach the gospel uh, to this beautiful church. And so uh, one word of warning, I do have expectations uh, that you're going to help me preach. So in, in case he didn't finish your training, let me give you a couple things you can do. Uh, if, if you're more reserved, you know, half my church is both white and Presbyterian. I'm not even joking. 1,100 people, half of them are white and Presbyterian. And so I know, and my wife is white, so I know that when white people are feeling the gospel, they take furious notes. So please, <laughs> you might not say amen, but if I don't see your pen moving, I'm going to be upset. Now, now, if you're ready to graduate, if you're ready to graduate, you can give me a little deacon hum. Mmm. Yeah, yeah, mmm. And if we got a few closet Pentecostals hiding in here, where you at? There we go. They in here. They don't know why they shouting, but they excited. You know, I, I tell my church all the time, if I could get the Reformed people to be excited about what they know and the Pentecostals to know what they're shouting about, we might have, we might have some biblical theology. Can we do it tonight? All right, listen, we're in John chapter 17. Go ahead and get your Bibles there if you got it. Uh, we're just going to read a few verses, and if you will indulge me, I want to treat you like my family. I'm going to treat you like my home. And so we stand and read the word together at Renovation Church. Can we do that together this evening? Uh, John chapter 17, we're just going to read verses 20 through 26 in Jesus' high priestly prayer. I believe that this is one of the most monumental moments in all of history. And we get to be privileged enough to look into the language that Jesus, our brother, would petition our Father with and have those words left for our edification. So John chapter 17 verses 20 through 26, read with me. Look what Jesus says. I do not ask for these only, come on now, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Y'all sound beautiful. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become what? Perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, 
even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Pray for me. I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to ask God's help on this word this evening. Father, I pray now that you grant us the grace of hearing. Father God, I am a feeble, fragile man. I have nothing to offer, but you are the living God. And so that is what I pray, Father, that you get me out of the way. Hide me behind your mighty hand so that every heart here, no matter where they are on their spiritual journey, those who have yet to believe, those who are struggling to believe, those who have always believed, Lord, that they would know leaving this place that they have been face to face with the living God. We ask it in your matchless name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. please be seated. When I first became a follower of Jesus, I made one fatal mistake. Just one fatal mistake that I, that I believe impacted my life in Christ for years to come. I genuinely believe that once I had the knowledge and once I had an understanding of what the Word of God had to say and once I got into a rhythm of having my, quote, quiet times and worshiping with some regularity that I could actually do this on my own. I was a Lone Ranger Christian. And I believe that by reading my Bible and and, and and living as closely uh, to the line that God had drawn in the sand as possible, and, and, and staying in some subsequent prayer and worshiping with some regularity that my faith and my life in Christ would have all that it needed, but it was a fatal mistake. Because if you read the narrative of Scripture, then you learn very quickly that we were never once, in any interpretation, any understanding of how our faith works itself out, supposed to do this alone. No, what God had in mind when he rescued you, if you are in fact a follower of Jesus, and if you're here this evening and you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm, I'm thankful that you would join us. I pray that as you listen in that, that you would ask the difficult questions of your own heart and ask God to make himself real to you. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, when, when he saved you, when he rescued you, when he adopted you, when he plucked you out of your old lifestyle, filled you with his spirit, granted you the righteousness of Christ, and cloaked you in the wonder that is Jesus, he did not do that to perpetuate your loneliness. That's your deacon home spot right there. You're going to learn. You're going to learn. I'm going to have you good and trained before I leave here. That's the way Atlantans say trained, trained. <laughs> no, what God intended, family, what God intended was something far greater. Not an individualistic Western understanding of our faith, but a united community, a family that God has brought together from every corner of the world, every generation of humanity, every peoples and every language and every tongue, a family that we would belong to with a singular father, a wonderful brother, and the empowering of the Spirit. It's called community. But I don't want to talk to you about community tonight in, in a fashion that we may typically do so. No, I want to speak to you about this united community that is founded, sourced, and secured in the Father himself. This united community that is, in fact, a reflection of the community that has existed for all eternity. Recently, one of my good friends, dear brothers and mentors, Dr. Ray Ortland, wrote this. He said, I love the Christian claim that ultimate reality is not cold, dark outer space. But ultimate reality is a person in community, bright, radiant, joyous, with volcanic exuberance, so irrepressible that he created us to share in his joy about who he 
is. The implications, he says, are endless. But for our time, we need to understand that what Pastor Ray is describing is the most beautiful mystery of our faith, the Trinity, and understanding that there is one God eternally existing in three persons, one God that is single in divine nature, co-equal and co-eternal, one in essence, one in action, one in power, one in will. It is what sets us apart from every other faith. There's an old document called the Athanasian Creed, an ancient document that explains the tenets of Christian faith. And in that document, it, it, it describes how the Father is uncreated and the Son is uncreated and the Spirit is uncreated. All three are eternal without beginning. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not names for different parts of God, but the name of the one God that exists in three person. This is the beauty of our faith. This is the beauty of what we believe. And it is an idea and an understanding that has existed both scripturally and historically not long after the man who wrote this wonderful gospel left this world. And though the word Trinity is found nowhere in the Bible, it's somewhere in there next to God helps those who help themselves. Not, just in case you missed that. It is an accurate description of God's self-revelation of who he is and the perfect community that he shares within himself. Now, why is that important? Because understanding that ultimate reality is a person in community. God, three in one, is foundational to our faith. It's important because understanding that ultimate reality is a person in community, God, three in one, is the only means by which we will ever understand ourselves and the only means by which we will ever understand how to relate to God or how to relate to one another. Understanding this truth is the only way that we will ever, quote, get community or how to be the church. And so though, as Dr. Ortland said, the implications are endless, let's settle on this one for our time today that we must grasp the enormity of God creating us for community with him and through him with one another. I'm going to give you a chance to write that down. We must grasp the enormity. I don't know another word to use. The, the magnitude, the giantness, the incredibleness of what it means that God literally created you to not only be in community with him, but through him to be in community with those that he's calling to himself. It's why you were made. It is why you're placed on this earth. In the closing statements of this powerful prayer, Jesus uses the word one four times. Four times he prays that we, us, all of us would be one, that we would be united, that we would be one with one another in and through our God who is the source and sustenance of our unity. This is something that we should marvel at. And I hope, I hope that the, the frailty of me trying to explain concepts so magnificent is not lost on this moment. That we have literally been invited to the table of the Father. But not as individuals. That's the hard part, isn't it? Especially for Americans. Notice I didn't say American. We just Americans. And that's the hard part, isn't it? That we wasn't invited to a solo dinner. We were invited to a big family reunion. And yes, your drunk uncle is going to be there. <laughs> look at me, look with me rather at Jesus' words. Starting again in verse 20, he says, I do not ask 
for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, before we launch into this, I want you to see how beautiful and specific just that sentence is. Throughout this high priestly prayer, you, you, you can read it for yourself at another time. Jesus first prays for himself, and, and then he prays for his immediate disciples, the 12 that are there. And, and so by way of application, if we are indeed followers of Jesus, then we can say that those prayers are for us as well. But here in verse 20, we see this incredible thing happen that Jesus literally prayed for you before you were even a twinkle in your daddy's eye. Now, you think about that. How can we believe for one minute that our life is purposeless, that it has no meaning, that it is somehow lacking something, when the king of glory literally sent up a prayer for people that had not even walked the face of this earth yet? He prayed for you. He prayed for me. This is a, this is a powerful idea. It gives, it gives tactileness and tangibility to the fact that Jesus still to this day intervenes on behalf of his people. But look what he prays. Not only that he prays, but look what he prays. He says in verse 21, I don't ask for these only, but for those who believe in their word, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. In a single sentence, in a single phrase, Jesus captures the, the essence of the universe our reason for being, the meaning of life, and the way that the church should exist in community through a series of God-sustained relationships. He prays first that his followers would be one, united, not divided. This is a oneness in purpose. This is a oneness in love. This is a oneness in submission. This is a oneness in understanding. This is a oneness in elevating what you need over my own selfish desires. This is a oneness in the magnification of the Lord, a oneness in our actions, in our forward momentum, in our walk, in our faith. This is a oneness in every understanding of the word that we can conceive relationally in how we are supposed to be connected to one another. Now, can we be honest for a minute? Do we really want that kind of unity? Don't lie to me with your eyes. <laughs> Private eyes are watching you, watching your every move. Don't you lie to me with your eyes. Of course you don't want that. I don't want that. No, it is, it is much easier to have me and Jesus' faith. It is, it is so much easier to exist in a sea of people, me and Jesus, until the bottom falls out. But that's not what Jesus desires for us because Jesus knows that we can't do it on our own. And so he prays that we would be one, a unity, not rooted in preference, not rooted in race, not rooted in class, not rooted in culture, but a God-given, God-sustained communal relationship with every single follower of Jesus from every single walk of life. That is the vision of the church. And understand that this, this is not the Elk Club. This is not a, a, a oneness based on some earthly organization or well-meaning human intentions. It is a oneness that is sourced from and founded on the original relationship, the community that God has within himself in the Trinity. Don't get lost on that idea. It gives you an understanding of the magnitude of what we have been offered in life in Christ. That we don't have to just make ourselves try to like each other. But that once the Spirit brings us alive, that, that our relational capacity opens up as far as Christ would have it to welcome in every family member. 
Amen. I don't want that big black guy. Why did they bring you down here? Just to yell at me. It's what I do. I have three callings in life. Love my wife, preach the gospel, yell random things at white people. It's what I do. <laughs> it's what I do. I'm the closer. It's what they bring me in for. I, I see you brown folks. I see y'all scattered in there. Power to the people. I see, I see you. I'm going to be serious. I'm going to be serious. Listen. Listen to Jesus' words again. That they may all be one. He continues. You, you, you think if Jesus repeats something, it might be important? I mean, do your kids know when you repeat it that you're serious? Oh, they know. Go clean your room, baby. You come back 10 minutes later. Hey. I don't know how to clean your room. <laughs> they know you're serious. They know you're serious. Jesus repeats this because he knows our nature. He knows he knows the distractions. He knows our tendencies. He knows the inherent selfishness in which we exist. Listen, you can lie. I'll tell the truth for you. He knows the inherent selfishness in which we exist. And so the idea that I would give up what I want so that you can be actualized in your faith, well, that's just pretty far-fetched. And yet that is exactly what he prays for, that they may all be one. How? Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So this is the pattern. In some sense, in, in, in some mystical way that we can't fully fathom, the Father is in Jesus. Jesus is in the Father, even though they are distinguishable. But John 14, 10, Jesus says, the works that I do, I'm not doing them. The Father is doing them in me. And at the same time, at the same time, all throughout the Gospels, you will see that Jesus say that, that, that I can't do anything because I'm so dependent on the Father, so attached to the Father. I don't move without the Father. I don't think without the Father. I can't breathe without the Father. The Father is everything, and yet they are distinguishable. And it's the same pattern that, they, that, that he's laying out for us. God's interworking love and relationship is the basis for the church's interworking love and relationship. If I was going to say it simply, I'd put it this way. We cannot understand the unity that we should have until we understand, dwell on, grasp, soak in, roll around in the unity that God has within himself. Until you have a full view. Notice, I didn't say full cognitive understanding, but a full view, a saturation. I get $2 every time I reference it. <laughs> a saturation. Saturate. In the, <laughs> in the mind-blowing magnitude of the ever existing, mutual submitting, beautiful dance that God is within himself, you won't even stick your toe in to living out the reflective nature of Christ's bride in community. We've got to see it as what it is. And so how do we get there? That's a fair question, right? So I've thrown out all these lofty ideas. How do we get there? Well, Jesus hasn't left us lacking. We get there from the original relationship, mirroring God in community with himself, and we get there via our relationship by the only means possible. This insane notion, hear me, this insane notion that we are somehow in God. You don't believe me. Let me, let me go back and read it again. 
Because if you would have believed me, one of you Pentecostals would have taken a lap. Don't let these Presbyterians oppress you. Take a lap if you want to take a lap. Listen, let me read it again. That they may all be one. We'll read it real slow. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be what? In who? Do you see it? Do you see it? You don't exist in proximity to God. Oh, you need to get that word tonight. You need to get that word. Because here's the deal. Do you know the reason why we find ourselves in sin patterns? It's because we don't actually believe God loves us. Because, because we have been convinced by the word, by the world and, and by the flesh and by the devil that we exist in proximity to God. We're still living in a temple model. Well, we got to get ourselves all scrubbed up to go into the Holy of Holies. Jesus says, I hung you nasty on the cross. You are not in proximity to me any longer. Oh, are you getting this word tonight? That, that we are literally in, in, in some mystical, wondrous, inexplicable way united mind, body, and soul to the Trinitarian God that we serve. We're in him. It's right there in the book. It's right there in the book. That we don't, we, don't, we don't orbit him like a planet does the sun. But cloaked in Christ's righteousness, we have entered into the purity of light and beauty and holiness and warmth and worthiness and not been burnt up. We're in him. It's easy to shout on that, ain't it? Until you hear the rest of it. This is the part I don't like. I'm always going to be honest with you. Long as you bring me down here, I'm never going to tell you a lie. I don't like this. Because all six foot five, 268 pounds of me says, yay, Jesus. Just... Just wrap me up in that Trinity blanket. I just want to go on in there by myself. But the Bible doesn't give me that, does it? No, this, this oneness with God is in no way to be viewed. This mystical union is in no way to be viewed as a walk into loneliness and aloneness with God. I know. I don't like it neither. This relationship cannot in any sense be understood as individualized or self-centered Western salvation that we have come to know and love. It can't be. It can't be. You know, this, this relationship of Christians with God where, where, where we are not orbiting in proximity, but rather existing in him in some sense is premised on a community who together experience oneness with God. Whew. I don't like that. But it just is. You know, sometimes as a pastor, you go to commentaries for two reasons. You go to commentaries to confirm that you're not crazy. Right, or that you haven't just pulled something out of the air, or to confirm that you are crazy and you can ignore an idea that you think you see in scripture and say, Oh, nope, I got that one wrong, right? And I was hoping that would happen here. And so I went to my old friend John R. W. Stock, good old, dead now, white theologian, you know, the only kind of Acts 29 turns to. And <laughs> 
And I said, I said, Mr. Stott, tell me I am misreading the text, please. Let me tell you what he said back. He said, the church lies at the very center of the eternal purpose of God. It is not a divine afterthought. Let me, let, me, let me break that down just real quick. God didn't start just saving people and was like, oh, no, I need something. Where, where do I put them? In a Walmart. Like, you know, <laughs> like that's, it wasn't a divine afterthought. It, it's, it's not, he didn't come up with an after the fact like, oh, I don't know what we're going to do with all these people. Start a church, persecute them, it'll grow, let it ride. America, you know, it's like, it's, I just want to break that down for a minute. Because, you know, Stott was English. He, he even spelled center wrong. R's don't come before E's. But, so I want to break it down. It was not a divine afterthought. Listen to what he says. On the contrary, the church is God's new community. You hear that? God was in community with himself. He didn't need nothing. He didn't want for nothing. Jesus, I'm lonely. I'm lonely too, Holy Spirit. Like as, he, he, he was all right. He was all right. But for, 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 for some for, for some reason that I, I mean, he says, my, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your thought, ways. For some reason, I, I, I can't grasp. He said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my community into, into the circle of my creation. Are you kidding me? The church is God's new community. For his purpose, conceived in an eternity past, being worked out in history, and to be perfected in a future eternity is not just to save isolated individuals and so perpetuate our loneliness, but rather to build his church. That is, to call out of the world a people for his own glory. People united with one another, a people submitted to one another in love, a people committed to one another in a God sourced, God sustained community, a singular love filled unit existing for the glory of God and for the good of one another. Can you imagine a community that rich, that magnificent, that wonderful, that love-saturated, that spirit-filled, that incredible? Can you imagine that type of community? It's what God wants for us. It's what God desires for us. It's, it's what God made us for. It is why he plucked you out and, and placed you in his family. Jesus dreamt of it. Jesus longed for it. Jesus prayed that it would be a reality. Are you going to tell me that I'm going to stand in the way of Jesus and his dream? God may it never be. And you know what is it's phenomenal about a community that loving and that attractive and, and that uh, sacrificial and, and that nourishing, it is alluring to people who don't serve Jesus. Listen, if, if we somehow, Renovation Church and, and the church at 1122, if we somehow, be, be because we understood the, the, the magnificence of the community that God contains within himself, and, and so we by his spirit and because we are in him began to reflect that community and live out of that community, you would never have to teach another evangelism class. Because by nature, by necessity, this relational masterpiece that Jesus is painting would have an outward-facing posture. 
just as God overflowed in such joy and goodness that he created us to share in it with him. A community this rich will necessarily overflow in a way that those who are outside of the faith will be drawn in. And isn't that what he always intended? That this relational intimacy that we could share with one another it is, is not to rest in self-satisfaction, but is always seeking to include those who have not yet been enraptured in this incredible mingling of souls. It is what he has shaped it for. It's what he made it for. And so the cycle of, of of redemption and, and the cycle of folding new people into the family and, and, the, and the cycle of reflecting the glory of the Trinitarian community that draws other people in and then those people draw other people in. That is how God grows his church. That is how God changes cities. That is how God will change the world. Now, we're going to land this plane. In our oneness, our three remaining gifts, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to breeze by these, but I didn't want to leave without them because they're, they're pretty incredible. In verse 22, Jesus says this, the glory, the glory, that you, sorry, it's just so short, uh, the glory <laughs> that you have given me, I have given them. I'm going to have a backache after this, I'm like, um, get some cinder blocks under this thing next time. Uh, the glory that you have given me, don't miss this, I have given them. The glory that you have given me, I have given them. That they may be one as we are one, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So three things, and I don't want you to miss this. The first thing Jesus says, say it over in your mind again, that he has granted us his glory? What in the world? We really need to spend some more time in this book. Not, not only have we been invited into the Trinitarian community, but we've been granted the glory of Jesus? What does that even mean? Let me give you a few ideas. It's, it, it, it's, the, it's the visible imprint in our lives that, that singles us out in both outlook and essence. It is what people see when they understand that we have been eternally changed, that we've been absolutely made magnificently different. He has crowned us, filled us with the same glory that the Father gave him. But again, this is not in singularity. This is not in isolation. This is not in individualism. But it is for the community as a whole so that we may be what? One. Perfectly one. Nothing less. Not only has he granted us his glory, but in this oneness, we also experience the fullness of the Father's love. Look at it again, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. In some ridiculous way, we experience the love of God just as Jesus does. Sit in that for a minute. Amen. Sit in that for a minute. God doesn't give you some discounted version of his love. God doesn't grant you some minimalistic understanding of his love. God doesn't look at you and say, well, because you got so much crap in your life, I can only give you this much. No. Yes, wow. Whoever just said that, yes, wow. That in your brokenness, in your mess, in all of your futility and mind, because we've been adopted into the family of God, he says, I love you just like I love Jesus. Are you kidding me? And the last thing, the last thing he says, in the close of his prayer, 
I believe, is the greatest of these gifts. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. The ultimate ends of our creation and the ultimate conception of our community is so that we as one may perfectly explore and enjoy and be enraptured in the perfected community that God has within himself. That we are not orphans, that we are not abandoned, that we have not been left behind. But at the end of this road called faith, at the end of this journey through this jagged and broken world, at the end of this reality, I told y'all I was a crier. <laughs> Listen, I, I just can't, I can't get over the fact that, that not only do we together get to taste the glory of God now, be invited into the community of God now. But that the ends, when heaven, Revelation 21, consumes earth, and the promise is fulfilled that, that God will dwell in the midst of his people, that we will see our Savior face to face. We will see our Savior face to face. There will be no more guilt. There will be no more separation. There will be no more fear. There will be no more doubt. Only light. Only glory. Only goodness. Only wonder. Only majesty. The little taste that we have now will be so full that to even dream of it makes my heart palpitate in ways that I cannot even contain. But even that, dear family, is not an isolation. True community is reflective of the Trinity. It is not an option, but a necessity for those who walk with him. True community is a reflection of the Trinity. It is not an option, but a necessity for those who walk with him. We will be with God. We are with God. And it is we whom he came for. And so let me say two things. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this is it. This is it. It, it. it is not some system of belief. It is the relationship with the living God and the relationship with his people. You're being welcomed into a new family. And if you are a follower of Jesus, but you've been living Lone Ranger Christianity, then tonight I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to, to come down here and pray and repent before the Lord and ask him to give you the God given courage to walk in community. Not because I told you to. Not because it's what churches do. But because it is an expression of how our living God exists within himself, what he has invited us into, and what he has granted us in his goodness to experience his glory, his love, his majesty, his magnificence, his presence, his goodness, all that he is together as a people. So I'm going to pray, and then they're going to play. And understand there's going to be some people down here to pray with you. Don't, listen, this is a big step for some of you. I know it is, but this is the beginning of saying I won't do this all alone. 
I won't do this all alone because God has more for me in my family than he does as an individual. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that you grant the timid courage, that you remove the shame of the guilty, that you bring freedom to the bound, that you release the captive as only you can, that we would see the we in the family that you're shaping, that we would refuse to do this alone. Jesus says that the enemy is like a roaring lion roaming to see whom he can destroy. Who do lions pursue but those lagging behind the pack? Father, will your family to be folded into one another in unity tonight. Let them be a force of love, reconciliation, beauty, and holiness, the glory and the grace of the Father in such an impactful way that Jax would never be the same because of what you've done here. Let us see your glory together. Grant us this grace in Christ's name. Amen.